Hey everybody, thanks for joining us on Taurus Tech Talk. For myself, Corey, and Robert, your co-hosts, um, we've got Tim and Greg in from Yamaha today visiting with us. This is our uh, first po podca podcast of the year, right? Vodcast, podcast? Podcast, podcast, yeah. It's the first first, Man. first one. Well, it's February 19th. We got all the way to the mid-February. I think we're slacking. <laughs> yeah. It's not, not good. But it's happy, happy to have uh, Yamaha for the first one of the year, though. I blame myself. It's the it's the it's the beginning of the year hangover. I didn't even drink on New Year's Eve. Yeah, well, I can't speak the same. Um, so, so guys, thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. Um, I've yeah. known I've known Tim for a very long time uh, since his days in in projects past, or I should say, employment past. Yes. Um, always a, a great mind in audio, and I've always uh, really loved to listen to the things that you had to say and the education you've given me. Um, so I appreciate that. No, thanks. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to be in the industry and, and how you, um, got to Yamaha? Yeah. Again, thanks for having us. First, I'd like to say based on the content of the coffee, it is a podcast, not a vodcast. <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> got it. But thanks for having us here. Yeah. Um, gosh, I started back, I grew up in California and, uh, in high school and just out of high school, I worked at a a high-end stereo shop uh, in, in Silicon Valley. So as you know, being at one of the best stereo shops in Silicon Valley, you meet a lot of dignitaries, some very interesting people, and get to work on some very, very interesting projects. Uh, this was back in the early 80s. I remember putting in the first cell phones. They were car phones before they were mobile cell phones and alarms and learned a lot. We did pro audio and again, got to meet some very fascinating dignitaries. But fast forward, I'm an IT engineer. I'm working uh, in, in the industry. I'm a Cisco engineer and I'm working on Ethernet networks, and I did some consulting for a company called NetStreams in Austin. And that's how I kind of got pulled back into AV. Uh, these guys were doing 720p raw over Ethernet. We were using IGMP technology. It's kind of pre-Crestron DM days. And from consulting with them, I joined the company, and from there, we got acquired by Clear One. So I was working with DSPs for five years, and then from there over to Revo Labs, um, who got acquired by Yamaha in 2014. So it's been an interesting ride. but. Yeah, from audio into IT, back into audio. Very cool. Very I, cool. I think I, I think I remember that from conversations past. Uh, you and I have a similar background. That's how I got started in AV was through networking and uh, basically Cisco switch routing work. And the company I went to work for did AV, and they were shorthanded. I was like, that's fine. I'll pitch in, whatever you need. And then I just never turned around and went back. Yeah. I envision um, I envision Tim holding a big stereo on your shoulder. Did you ever do that? No, I never had the. Uh, Come on, man! You didn't do the boombox. No, no. But um, I was the kid in the in the car stereo contest with the head muffs on, you know, cranking four thousand watts, trying to destroy my hearing. So, <laughs> but no, I'm sure no, we've all done a little bit of that. No, no boombox. I okay. was the romantic holding my boombox outside my girl. Nice. <laughs> say anything. That's a say anything reference. I love so, it. So hold on. Car audio. What was your, how long ago was that? Gosh, this was in the early 80s. We were doing, a, I actually put in the very first CD player for a car. It was the Alpine 5900. and it didn't, Alpine. I haven't heard that name in a minute. didn't even have a radio in it. It was just a CD player. And what I are remember, you, 90? <laughs> no kidding. I remember putting this thing in and, uh, test drove the car and it skipped over the first speed bump poorly badly it was just horrendous but yeah it was uh it was fun we used to do a lot of high-end stuff i actually did steve wozniak's car one time okay that's cool did he did he, he, he let's see mid to early 80s he probably didn't have the wozniak dollar bills yet did he did was, he pay you in wozniak he, money he did not pay me in Woz money no but uh it was a jaguar uh xj12 and we used to hide, we used to do like... I'm uh, sorry. Cuss, yeah. <laughs> it's actually a neat car, but we used to do, you know, up to 10, 12 speakers all hidden in a car. We used to do leather perforations and all sorts of custom stuff. And uh, in his car, I got permission from my boss to do an Apple logo to hide the tweeters behind instead of just a round pattern. And this is pre-internet, so I didn't have an Apple logo. I couldn't Google an Apple logo. I actually went to a computer store up the street and, and got somebody to tear a ear off of one of the boxes that had an Apple logo on it, took that back to the shop, and to this day I still have a little uh, a little vinyl 
template that I made that for. That's it. incredible. He loved it. He showed up and saw it, and he was he was pretty jazzed. With it. So four thousand watts. What was your go to subwoofer back then? Oh, we had so many. Um, was Sundown around then? We used to do Seos thirteens. I mean, just you name it. Um, probably my favorite sounding subwoofers were ADS. It's a German speaker company. Okay. We used to do an array of ADS tens. I, I like tens. They're pretty tight, not too yeah tubby and loose and. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it was a great experience. I got to do pro audio as well. And one of the neat things back then was uh, building your own crossovers, you know, second and third order crossovers, you know, 12 dB slope, 18 dB slope per octave. Doing all of that work back then and the basics of audio, you know, tweeter placement, woofers, making crossovers, uh, doing a, um, analysis of the, we used to actually put a microphone in where the driver was. And what oh, was that? Audio, I can't remember the name of the company, but would, would flatten it, EQ the car based on the, sitting position, much like Yamaha does now with their mm -hmm. home surround sound systems. But yeah, it was a great, uh, great background, great introduction for everything that's come after that. Uh, all the way from you know, mounting speakers, learning how to hide speakers, making grill cloths, acoustic panels. Everything I learned back right after high school really paid dividends later on when I got back into the industry. Huh. It reminded me of like um, when I was a kid, we had, we had one buddy that had the CD player uh, the, you know, the portable Walkman, I think it was Walkman, uh, that had the tape, yeah. uh, you know, auxiliary piece, because none of us could afford the CD player like Wozniak. Um, <laughs> and, uh, man, it was skip every time. And then they came out with one that had anti-skip on it. And, you know, we, we put, took a piece of double-sided Velcro and, like, Velcroed it to the, to the, <laughs> to the console. Yeah, that's all I was thinking about when you were talking about skipping on the... Yeah, it's amazing how far we've come with uh, music. I mean, it used to be audiophile, quality over quantity. And then um, I, too, have joined the new generation. It's really nice having 2,000, 3,000 songs in yeah. your pocket with its yeah. access to all of them. So you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time categorizing music, like, on a hard drive and building playlists. And now I just open Pandora or Spotify, and I'm like, artist, artist, uh, music like this artist. Yeah. And I just, it's, it makes it, you think about where, where it's going to be in another 25 years. Well, I'm talking hours, hours, and hours, endless amounts of time building this library, which I still have because it, it, it's like if you spend a thousand hours doing something, you can't just throw it away. But I can't tell you the last time I've played a song off that hard drive. I, <laughs> but I, I just can't bring myself to hit the delete button. I, I don't know. <laughs> I so, know Greg, tell goes. us about yourself. How did you come well, to Yamaha? I, I'll tell you, Tim is the interesting one of the two of us. My background isn't quite so exciting. You know, but uh, <laughs> you didn't and, build a car for an executive <laughs> at Apple? No, but obviously, you know, ba based on my age, my, uh, my history with audio goes back a little further. And on a personal nature, I remember installing an 8-track nice. system in my 66 Mustang and laying there and listening to you know, uh, stereo content for the first time. You know, it was just blowing me away that music was coming out of the two different speakers. Whoa, that's the left speaker. <laughs> There's the right speaker. Exactly. What, a, what a world. How did they do that? <laughs> yeah, but I, I got into, um, in, into AV in a little bit of a different route. I started out back in my career. Uh, I actually originally started out in HR and uh, was working for a major Fortune 200 company dealing with the labor union. You know, and just it was a very reactive type of position. You know, yeah. Every day, just dealing with problems that the labor, the, the yeah. union would bring up to me. Was and that was that here in Texas? Obviously, no. Not, it was right? actually is, that was actually up in upstate New York in the okay. Finger Lake region in New York. I'm a I'm a Jersey guy. I was originally. gonna say I get a little I get a little Eastern vibe out of yeah, you. Yeah, I'm born and raised in New Jersey. Lived in upstate New York for a number of years. Uh, moved back to Jersey uh, for a while uh, to be a little bit closer to family, and then. 14 years ago, my wife and I said, we're moving to North Carolina. So we just decided to pick up and make the move. And it That was doesn't great. sound like a it. terrible decision. Yeah, no, no, it was, a, it was a really good decision. My Can kids, you pump your own gas in North Carolina? You cannot. Really? No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can't. I know you Jersey, can't. You I know you can't, can't right? in Jersey. It, I was just back in Jersey recently, and, and you still can't in Jersey. So, <laughs> <laughs> You know, song. there's a ton of places. I just got back from Oregon. There's a ton of places. I didn't realize the, the state of Oregon... You can't, you know, oh, really? a lot of places you can't pump your oh, own I gas. I thought New Jersey was the only state that still had Well, um, to, 
be candid. I mean, we were driving between Portland and this place called Bandon, which is about four and a half hours southwest. And you go through these small towns, which barely look like they have 500 people in them. And the single gas station you'd stop at. I'm sure they're trying to keep the jobs. but Well, they hadn't heard about the law change. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. Probably hadn't got out to there. <laughs> but but anyway, I, I wanted to get into a more react or a proactive type of position. So decided to get into technology sales. It was, this is way back when you know, I was selling uh, word processing systems, you know, and then that evolved into actually PCs running word processing software and, and so on. Then went to work for a, a, a data systems integrator. So I was in the data world for a while, worked for Bay Networks. I got acquired by Nortel. So that kind of brought me into the telephony world for the first time. Um, so I was working for Nortel for a number of years, had some major account positions and some regional things, channel manager organizations. Uh, they uh, ultimately, as you probably know, went bankrupt um, due to some you know, fiscal malfeasance. And um, Avaya uh, uh, scooped up the enterprise division that I was part of. So I worked for Avaya uh, for a number of years and then left and got into the AV world. One of the guys that uh, I worked with at Nortel and Avaya um, became a regional manager for a large systems integrator and contacted me about joining their team. You know, he just knew me as an as an individual and how I handled accounts. So uh, I uh, ended up joining that integrator in North Carolina. I was there for three and a half years, and that's how I actually first met Tim, uh, doing some Revolabs installations. Uh, had some uh, great success with it, and then. How long were you were you uh, with Nortel Avaya offering those systems? Uh, let's see. I think it was. Um, mm. I actually did two stints with Nortel because at, at one point I did get laid off after the big dot, dot com, you know, the big boom uh, and then bust. Uh, so uh, um, ended up going outside of IT for just a short period of time, realized I really, that's where I really liked being. So jumped back in, ended up moving to North Carolina at that time, rehired with Nortel, you know, after a few months there. So probably about 13 years total uh, wow, time okay. between the two companies. Uh, about about 10 with Nortel and three with uh, Avaya. When I was at my previous employment, part of my some of my early responsibilities was configuring uh, Avaya and Alcatel VoIP systems mm -hmm. on Cisco networks, mm -hmm. specifically because the guys that worked there were all analog or digital PBX guys. And the VoIP stuff was just like, yeah, it just didn't make any sense to anybody. And well, it's interesting because Nortel really developed the initial yeah. system for Cisco. You know, uh, they kind of helped Cisco get started in that business. And, and then I'm sure there's help. dozens of companies that have the similar claim, and Cisco just scoops them up. They also they also had a partnership with Microsoft that went very much decidedly in Microsoft's favor, and so pretty much created the, that voice technology. For that Microsoft. that sounds to me like a uh, small fish big pond problem yeah some real some real bad management mistakes for me <laughs> it, it, it's hard though because it you know we even run into this sometimes you want to be involved with a larger player on a bigger scale and so sometimes you you know you make decisions that are not questionable but on the fringe with the impetus that it could lead to much bigger things and sometimes you get swallowed up <laughs> so when i first got into av talking about swallowing i, I felt like i was you know uh, drinking from a fire hose when I first joined <laughs> AV. Because, oh, AV is. You know, it was much more complicated. Uh, you know, there's so many different standards that I had. And I was, you know, coming into the transition, you know, from the analog world to the to the IP world. And and so there was so much to learn. And, um, but but it was so much more fun. Yeah. The sale in AV is much more fun, in my opinion. It's a, it can be a bit of a feast or famine business, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, People are always going to need phones, and they're always going to need internet to run their day-to-day -day business. But if things get tight, they're not going to be—they're not going to be open in the purse strings to build a new studio or conference room, or you know, they're going to do the the bare minimum. So that's that's always been our thing: uh, is making sure we stay engaged with all of our clients for years and years and years, sure. rather than just hey, here's one project and then move on to the next client. We're we're retention rate is is really important for that reason you know but well, client retention is a much better way to do sales it's much yeah. more effective much 
more cost effective. Oh, absolutely. Trying to absolutely. Well, that's that's, um, that's Robert's territory. I, <laughs> I, I I'll leave that to the master. <laughs> so, uh, so Greg, tell us about Yamaha. I know a lot of our viewers and listeners are going to know Yamaha from probably personal experiences, professional experiences. So, give us an overview of what Yamaha encompasses, and then let's let's bring it down to to the division that you guys work in. Sure. Okay, great question. So, like you said, everybody knows Yamaha. Everybody has a favorite Yamaha product that they, you know, have used or ever had for years. One of the fun things about our job is and walking around with the Yamaha name on our jackets or shirts or that we get stopped multiple times every day. People want to talk about their motorcycle or their drum set, their guitar. <laughs> That's okay. the first thing that came to mind was uh, was uh, motorcycle motorcycles. Yeah, what their wave runner, their boot engine, <laughs> you know, their, what, whatever. I mean, Yamaha has created so many products and and dominates in a lot of areas that uh, it's kind of funny because I'll get stopped all the time, and then they want to start talking. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to talk about my products. I'll, I'll bore you. you know? <laughs> but the funny thing is, is on the plane on the way down here. I sold a YVC 200 to the woman who was sitting next to me. So that's she, cool. She is a ghost writer for athletes. Oh, and okay. Has worked with a lot of athletes in the Dallas market, and uh, she just fell in love with with the product. She said, "I'm buying it as soon as we get off the plane." Yeah. So, you know, so it's kind of. It sounds like you, a perfect fit for, for, for the portability. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool. it wasn't so, a boring conversation then. Apparently. No, no, not no, at all. That, then Greg's a true salesman. <laughs> <laughs> so we're 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 part of uh, the music division. Basically, there's two major components the yamaha corporate you know if you got you've got your motor uh, sports division and then your music division uh we're a very small but very important part of the music division so we're the newest uh, group at yamaha um you know obviously yamaha bought reva labs in 2014 kind of you know stayed low for a while there typical uh yamaha fashion is to you know really learn the business slowly start to make the changes yeah. very methodical uh, I joke around about how, you know, Yamaha's short-term planning is three to five years. Our short-term planning here is like three to five weeks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, we've gotten accustomed, you know, to that now. And But because of that, when they release a product, it's usually a kick-ass, you know, kind of thing. Uh, and, and it performs really well. And I think that's, that's the most important thing is the performance. Uh, you know, it may not be cutting edge in terms of, uh, look, you know, uh, usually they're pretty simple and streamlined and so on. There's sort of an understated Yamaha look to most of the products, uh, but uh, performance is outstanding. And so I think that at the end of the day, that's what really counts. Yeah, I've always yeah. felt the same. I I can't tell you how many times as an integrator, you know, someone as a manufacturer wants to rush to market with a product because they're seeing that maybe that market is expanding and it's really, really hot and they want to just rush and make that money and at the detriment of what you know us as an integrator are putting the name behind it and we're going to install it or configure it or whatever and we want that product to be tried and true so it makes me feel really great to to know that a yamaha product is going through that that r d process going through all of that before it gets put out into the fields because it makes a big difference well in, in full candor i mean you know we know those of that have been in the industry for a while uh, Reva Labs had some great products. They they introduced your know, wireless, you know, microphones for conferencing, um, and and had some real success. But then rushed a second generation product out to market, and in some cases we still have that black eye. You know, we're we're hardly the only company that's ever had, you know, um, expanding battery issues. You know, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, there was a time where you couldn't get on an airplane if you had a Samsung Galaxy in your pocket. That uh, wasn't right? too long ago. Uh, that wasn't that long ago. But, you know, there are some other companies that had panels coming off the walls and things like that. But, you know, it's um, Reva Labs was a very small company and did not really handle it well. Didn't have $1.5 billion or whatever to buy back that mistake, right? Like Samsung. So, um, you know, we paid the price. And one of the things, one of the very smart things that Yamaha uh, and Reva Labs did together was we took our third generation product, Executive Elite Wireless Mics, and gave it to Yamaha engineers to improve upon it. So the firmware improvements that have been made have been outstanding and, you know, it's just rock solid now. So that, that kind of, just not to highlight that product, but goes back to Yamaha's, you know, way of doing business and their their uh, emphasis on quality control. 
there's four gates of quality control that a product has to go through. And so sometimes you're waiting for it to come out. And like, well, we haven't passed gate four yet, you know, we're waiting for that sign off. So uh, I, I will say from an integrator perspective it, and me being more on the engineering side, having a product that comes from a trusted name that doesn't quite meet the mark or you spend a bunch of time doing manufacturer R&D at a customer job site is the worst thing that can happen. I mean, it's one thing if we buy it, right, and it doesn't work for us, or we test it and we find a few pitfalls or some misleading white paper documentation, uh, and, and that is a really big challenge that a couple of years ago, we just simply decided we're unwilling to offer any prob product to a customer that we haven't brought in-house and tested on our own. Basically, compared what the data sheets say versus what it actually does and how it behaves as best as we're capable of testing it. And a lot of times, it'll perform all of the functions, but maybe it's a little different, right? It, 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 it's, it's adhering to the standards, but it's, you know, maybe this is a little delayed or this takes a little longer or this was an unexpected result. And, and uh, for us, it just allows us to have that confidence when we take that product into a customer. Doing R&D at a job site is, gosh, the worst thing. Because we commission a system, and we, we turn it up, and we train on it, and then we leave. And then the customer calls and goes, hey, did you know it doesn't do this, or it does that, or this sounds terrible? And we go back and forth with the manufacturer and the customer until we either replace it or resolve it. And... We've all been there. So, yeah, sure. yeah I, I'm Such happy to hear that. Story. <laughs> yeah. we Even could just Tim do, with his car CD players. Yes. We could just sit here and do war stories for a few <laughs> hours, right? Yeah. So, it, But it's it's good to hear that Yamaha has continued to kind of carry that thought process into the UC division and continue to improve right. the Revo products because um, – and not to bash on Revo, but we had a lot of trouble with the early Revo products when we picked them up as a yeah. as a manufacturer before they were scooped up by, yeah. by Yamaha, and it kind of became a product that was on our on our blacklist. And um, kind of hearing what you're saying, it it may be worth a, a revisit on our part. Yeah, absolutely, well, we've had a lot of people change their minds now with uh, with the latest generation of the products, and we're. Uh, Yamaha is not redoing all of the Revo products. Right now, the Revo products are a product line underneath the Yamaha name brand, but all new solutions are, are going to be Yamaha. In fact, the engineering uh, really has been moved to Hamamatsu, Japan, okay. at Yamaha's corporate uh, headquarters and their innovation lab. Tim can tell you some great stuff about that because he actually got to go to Japan last year. So our UC engineers, and I believe there's about 50 of them now, work side by side with the music engineers and the pro audio engineers and so on. So there's a, you know, there's great symbiotic relationship now with these groups working together. And that's really what we're all about is kind of bringing that audio fidelity from the music and professional audio into our UC solutions. Nice. So some of our really low end solutions, the technology that's in there just blows you away. And we're excited with the opportunity to get out and, demo and show people um, because we've got some really cool stuff. Yeah. So I was looking through some of your products and I'm very familiar with the the Revo look and feel. The 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 square microphones that are branded Yamaha that are that that sit in the docking station. Is that Revo technology or is that a Yamaha technology from a from a scratch perspective? So I'll I'll jump in on that one. I think uh, and this has come up before the square microphones you're referring to aren't are from Yamaha, but they were never conferencing microphones. So we've okay. seen that a few times where people go, hey, I've seen these square mics. Not from the Unified Communications Division. So yeah, you know, Yamaha obviously makes microphones, uh, being in the music right. business. But um, they're, the, the old square based ones that you've seen aren't, aren't something that are in the conferencing sector. So, so, um, t so Tim, tell us a little bit about in the music division and the UC space, uh, why don't you give us some highlights on some of the styles of products that Yamaha offers? And what we'll do for our viewers is we'll uh, we'll put up some some images and some links to some of these some of these categories. Yeah. So again, as as Greg had mentioned, I was, was fortunate enough to go to Japan last year. Um, they are the music division is. 
based in Hamamatsu, about 15 miles up the road in Iwata, is the uh, motor division. Well, and, and the, uh, Tim, not to get too sidetracked, but aren't you a motorcycle guy? Yeah. Did you did you get some? Would come up at some point. <laughs> did, you, did, did you get some free time to to detour by I, chance? I did. Uh, There's a <laughs> wonderful friend of mine in Japan named uh, um, uh, Daigo, and he, at the last day, while well, we were uh, we were there for nine days and seven days doing extensive work at, at uh, Hamamatsu. But I'd mentioned that you know he, he knew I used to he knows I used to road race motorcycles and have been a Yamaha nut. Um, in fact. I was doing backflips when Yamaha acquired us because I raced Yamaha. I was kind of bleed blue Yamaha blood. So I was always a Yamaha proponent, and to be purchased by Yamaha was fantastic. And then to get to go there was amazing. But, yeah, the last day he uh, arranged for a Yamaha a vehicle to take me over to the museum. We got to spend four hours at the Motor Museum. It was really a bucket list type thing for me. And they were laughing because I cleaned out the entire gift shop. <laughs> and I was leaving with a box. I, I was going to say a new suitcase or a box size, you yes. got to ship home. Um, they, they were just laughing. I, I bought up the entire gift shop. And it wasn't until I got out in the parking lot with this massive box that I realized, hey, I got to get on a bullet train and I got to fly home with this stuff. And I've already got a suitcase and a backpack. And how am I going to do this? But You were too too excited, like a kid in a candy store. Yeah, too excited. But back to the question. Yeah, we uh, got to go to Yamaha's new technology center. It's a uh, millions and millions of dollars facility right next to the old headquarters and housed within it is also their innovation road museum and where they showcase products from every every division including ours it's pretty nice to see our ybc 300 and 1000 series up on the wall but they have as greg mentioned the largest sound chamber in the world is at this facility wow. the speaker test labs the technology and what gets done under the hood there i think that's what really impressed me and everybody has a conference speaker phone the technology under the hood of ours and why our sound better really became evident to me on that trip because of the collaboration between all of the engineers from the music department i didn't realize yamaha made every single instrument in an orchestra and has a facility to play it they have an orchestra facility whatever you call those auditoriums but it is an amazing company with amazing technology uh, the human voice activity detection their noise suppressors just the way they approach technology. I had a long conversation with one of the engineers about how their echo canceled algorithms are written. And they're actually analyzing the difference between AI written algorithms and still human based written algorithms. So these guys really are on the cutting edge with the technology. And to go to that facility and see how they do it and how they pull it together. And the product feel too, as Greg mentioned, it's very understated. The products have a very similar look across them. You know, you can, we walked into a room yesterday, and from across the room, I could tell it was a Yamaha mixer right off the bat. You know, the Virage mixers from the Pro, Pro Division are just impressive stuff. But to know that they bring the technology from every one of their sound divisions. They've been in Pro Audio since 1969. Now, I've only been wow. on the planet since 1965. <laughs> so as long as I've been walking around, they've been working on audio and putting that technology into the products. That's really cool. So have you gotten to go to Japan? I have not. Not yet. I could I, tell I, earlier I, when he said Tim I, got to go. Well, yeah, uh, I, I wasn't gonna wasn't gonna point it I, out. But. I, I, I lobby every chance I can get. Don't know. worry, uh, don't worry, Greg. We'll get you there, buddy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you should have seen the look on Greg's face when they said I might get to go back again. He was like, oh, I haven't been once. <laughs> so, yeah, it's yeah. an amazing company. Really well, what, well, what's kind of neat, you know, we're talking about we're part of the music division, but also how. Um, Yamaha dominates the marketplace in Japan. You know, we're really unknown still here in the U.S., but in, in Japan, you know, we have all our own switches and routers. We outsell the competition in there. We have 56% market share in uh, UC desktop, you know, uh, tabletop devices. Um, Yamaha's been making speaker phones since 2006, uh, which people aren't aware of, you know. So it's, yeah. it, we're, we're sort of this real great unknown secret uh, you know, in the U.S., so that's our job is... To do to, the, to get the word out. For it and, and this is a wonderful opportunity to Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I didn't realize as well. Um, did you know Yamaha is the largest investor in uh, Avnet in Dante technology? Well, I had I, no idea. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I knew that they used Dante as a primary audio transport for digital audio, but I didn't know that yeah, they were. were the largest investor in Audinate. So That's Yamaha cool. really is a, is a front runner with Dante technology, and it, it, it's used across all of our platforms now. And we're, yet, we're seeing it more in the UC space as well for pretty much all That's, the Yamaha products. So 
man, I just feel kind of kind of dumb, I We've guess. We've had topics specifically over Dante, and, <laughs> and no one's ever mentioned that, so that's pretty neat. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, we had a podcast not long ago where it was not really a versus, but we had we had uh, uh, kind of a Dante heavy guy and um, AVB. A- AVB heavy guy and really talked about the positive negatives of, of both. And it never one time came up that uh, Yamaha carries the, the the biggest investment in that. Now and, we can and educate on, them. Well, and honestly, <laughs> it, it didn't even come up in our in our our research. So, really, yeah, you 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 guys should work hard to get the name out there. If you you know if you're really offering, we we do, I, we, I, and I think you're going to see yes. a, lo- a lot of new things this year. So, you know, Great. particularly like at Infocom. I would have never guessed that you guys had that large of a market share. I mean, I kind of understand in the U.S., but outside of the U.S., that you have that large of a market share. One of the things that surprised me was routing and switching. You know, that's my background. I used to design meshed Ethernet networks and Cisco guy. Yamaha is Cisco of routing and switching in that market. Uh, they just dominate and own that market. Yeah, again, completely unaware. So I'm glad you guys are here. Yeah. I, I have I have homework to do because I... I to be honest, I knew that they made musical instruments. I know that they make microphones. I know that they have a. Uh, I, I I knew that they had a very large audio presence from live instrumentation perspective, but really, I kind of thought the UC division was this kind of tiny little bubble that you guys were over here, and it doesn't. It sounds like that that uh, is a complete misnomer. I I. I, well, I read he, that all wrong. And even in motorsports, you know, Yamaha built engines for Toyota for the Toyota Supra and other race cars and stuff. So well, having, there's so many more products that we don't even know about. You know? Oh, well, having been another a, hour with you guys after <laughs> yeah. this show. Yeah, for sure. It was amazing going to Japan and seeing what they do. Having been a bike guy and a, a, a car guy, I'm very familiar with Yamaha's automotive history. Uh, so uh, I, I just I have more work to do. All right, so I have something to admit. Um, I think early on in my career, if I were going to go into a, a space with a customer and they wanted to talk about conferencing, um, I would put first video. I would because that's what you see. You know, it's you want a beautiful projection system. You want a beautiful flat panel display. Um, how do we share content? What does that look like? And that was always lead. And uh, really. Uh, Kudos to you and a couple of other audio geniuses that I know that really started to hammer home that audio in a conferencing environment is, um, and I've said it before on the show, is every bit as important, if not more important, than video. Because we we make a lot more phone calls than we do video calls still today. I'm sure that'll change. But um, it's, it's paramount. So why don't you, um, Tim, take us through some of the products for conferencing solutions and meeting spaces that Yamaha uh, complements that for. Yeah, for sure, and, and thanks for that. I, I have been preaching for many years that A is the most important part of AV. I think you made me feel pretty bad about my life one time. <laughs> You're like, man, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right uh, now? You need, to sp- you need to pick the right speaker. <laughs> well, if you remember a few years ago, telepresence was, well, maybe more than a few now, telepresence was going to be the big thing, and these telepresence rooms were massively expensive. Yeah. Um, I was in a $900,000 telepresence room when the audio went out. And I leaned over to the guy and I said, you know what you got now? He said, what's that, Tim? I said, you got $900,000 surveillance because you ain't got a meeting. <laughs> so, you know, you I, just... I, I've kind of been the opposite of Robert. I've always said, you know, the video could be iffy or choppy or, or glitchy, but if the audio sounds good, the people will forgive the video faster. Now, where I agree with him is when you walk into a room... The microphones are not typically the wow feature. Oh, sure. As a matter of fact, you guys and many other manufacturers have spent millions of dollars trying to hide them, right? <laughs> uh, whereas with displays, we've spent millions of dollars trying to make them a focal point, whether it's a video wall, whether it's a laser projector and, and a, uh, ambient rejection screen or whatever the case may be. But we do the opposite with audio. Somehow that's... Uh, that's a detractor in a nice space, whereas video is is not. It's it's an it's an odd dynamic. Now that I think about it, so it's a little bit like behind every successful man, there's a woman. That's you know, true. Behind every 
It's oh, just man. Good analogy right there. So, so my wife is the microphone, the audio setup, and I'm... I think I'm I'd the, probably get my wife to watch this episode I, I, I now. hope my wife hears that. <laughs> i got to say my wife's the DSP. I'm peripheral. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, to that point, right? When there's a problem in that room and there's bad audio, who do they blame? They look right down on that table and find that microphone, look at the brand name on that microphone, and it doesn't matter if it's the network or the DSP or something upstream from that. So, yeah, the microphone is the unsung hero in, in many regards. No, you, you, you've got it wrong, Tim. The speaker on my table doesn't <laughs> oh, work. Oh, gosh. The speaker yeah. on my table doesn't we, work. How times I heard <laughs> yeah. that. How often and I'm like, the mic you, mean, you mean a microphone? No, the speaker on my table. And it's like, uh, you know what? You're right. The speaker on the table doesn't work. We'll get it fixed. I so listened what? to a customer say it six times in a meeting. And then I started to, to kind of go into my, my points. And I swear I repeated it back. You know, this speaker. Oh, no. You're like, screw it, I'll go there. Yeah, it's a speaker. I'm sorry, Tim. Go ahead. No, no, no. Sometimes you just got to join the conversation. (laughs) I I was going to say one of our great success stories uh, back when I was with the integrator was this uh, former customer called up and was screaming at me on on the phone, you know, and just, I didn't know the woman at all. And she's like, you know, whatever you do, you you can't come in here and sell us Reva Labs microphone. We will never have those again. Blah, 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 blah. You know, and I said, hold on a second. First of all, who are you? You know, and then, um, you know, let me come over. Let's do a little bit of investigation to see what the problem is. And so uh, it turns out the issue was their programming on the DSP and the programming yeah. on the control panel. But like we talked about, everybody sees the microphone on the table. Yeah, very so uncommon story I, there. I took out one of Reva Labs newer, you know, the executive elite mics, and I handed it to her. Their name is, you know, embossed down on the corner. It's not quite as prominent. And she loved it. She's oh my I would definitely get a microphone like this. This is great. I love the way it feels. Use double A <laughs> batteries and so on. So I walked out of there after her telling us that they would never buy Reva Labs again. I walked out of there with a thirty two channel sale of executive elite. Nice. <laughs> you know, and Tim worked with me on that. So. Uh, <laughs> but back to Robert's uh, Robert's question about Yamaha and the technology and audio and, and what they bring to it. Um, obviously, echo cancellation is the primary thing you got to have in conferencing, and that happens at the DSP level. But I, I think what Yamaha for those brings, that don't understand that may be listening or viewing, to just real quickly give us echo cancellation automatic thirty, echo 30 second synopsis. So no echo canceling one hundred and one. <laughs> it's pretty simple. When I'm on the telephone, when I'm speaking to you and I got my cell phone up to my head, my head is the echo canceller. It is stopping the audio from the speaker going back into the mic and being sent back to the far end. When you're in a conferencing environment, you have speakers in the ceiling and microphones on the table. You have to, when Sally says hello in Chicago and it comes out the speaker, I hear it, but so does my mic and it gets sent back to Sally. So that's what echo cancellation is, stopping that return path. We've all heard echo cancellation. It's typically a second and a half. It's different from uh, uh, network uh, delay. Uh, Acoustic echo is about a second and a half. So when you go, hi, Bob, hi, Bob, you hear yourself back, that's classic acoustic echo. And the interesting thing about it is it's always the other person's equipment. (laughs) If I'm in in Chicago and I'm talking to New York and I hear my name back at myself, it's New York's equipment that's bad, not mine. Yeah. So it's the far end that has to cancel. Why are you passing the buck, Tim? Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) That's good education. Why why, why are you you passing the buck? It's, it's always been interesting to say that. Oh, I hear myself back. I'm like, well, it's not our problem, is it? <laughs> you know, my other favorite one, too, is when people go, your microphone's not working. All I get is feedback. I'm like, well, if you got feedback, it's certainly working. <laughs> it's so, work, working too well, unfortunately. Well. But, uh, yeah, so back to the, the Yamaha technology. Uh, what we're seeing now in the conferencing space is a slight change from what we've seen in the past. We're seeing glass conference rooms, open work collaboration spaces. These these are presenting a whole new set of challenges on the technology side. And where Yamaha has been really positioned well to deal with that, um, we have human voice activity detection. We're able to noise filter in the human speech range where most people filter around it because they can't really differentiate speech. We have such advanced algorithms that we can actually not just see speech because of the range it's in, but the patterns themselves. So now we can filter through that range as well. So our noise suppression is better. We have on most of our conference products, de-reverberation, which is critical in these glass conference rooms. Again, it's been interesting to see uh, the change in the industry over the last 10 years from well-designed conference rooms with acoustic panels, carpeted floors, the materials have been thought through well, and it's an acoustically uh, good environment. Well, you, you, you bring that up and then you look at the space we're in. 
Yeah, so and we have yeah. we have we have glass. I mean, not everybody can tell. Seventy-five percent glass. Seventy-five percent glass. I noticed you put and, the blinds down, though. <laughs> well, that's more for lighting than it is for for acoustics. Same with you guys, right? So this mm-hmm. is where people are going. There's less consideration on the acoustic properties of the room, which puts a greater demand on the technology to be able to deal with those challenging environments. So with with a lot of the technology under the hood that we have, even rooms with long RT60 time or, or really reverberant rooms. Uh, our products just sound better in. And to try and disseminate that to the customer, yeah, it's a speaker phone, it's $350. The customer, you know, our competitor has one too. Why is ours better? Please don't ask me that because I will talk your ear off for about an hour <laughs> telling you exactly why ours are better. Because having gone to Japan and seen, worked with the Japanese engineers, you know, we have dereverberation, we have auto gain control, we have uh, mics that when there's no speech going on, they don't pass any audio to the far end. We now have a range of products that are coming out where you can be in a noisy cafeteria. And we have what's called sound cap. Creates a little virtual one meter bubble around you guys. And with far field noise rejection, we're really not listening to anything outside that bubble or transmitting that audio to the far end. So as these rooms and environments change in today's business, um, you need really good advanced technology under the hood. Anyone can make an okay microphone element. Most people can make a decent speaker. It's the processing between those two that really makes the difference yeah. in the products. So have we reached the limitation on traditional microphone element constructions? I mean, are, are we 100% dealing with the transport and the DSP at this point to improve that? Yeah, I think the, the key thing is you need to have more than one mic. So if you can have an array of mics, then there's a lot more you can do. You can look at the time arrival of sounds and, and, and look at what's going on between the mics. We can actually calculate the size of the room from one of our $350 conference phones. Every one of our products is constantly adjusting the equalization as well. For example, our, our YVC-1000. Uh, this thing's phenomenal, kind of an unsung hero in our lineup. It's the number one selling UC solution in Japan. And another conversation, by the way, Japan skipped SIP. They never even went to SIP. So they are advanced beyond other countries as far as UC. Because right. they went straight from PBX to cell phone in UC. They skipped, they skipped uh, uh, voice over IP. That, that part number is a very... Yamaha part number, by the way. The YVC-1000? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it could easily be a four-wheeler or a motorcycle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, our, our, our nomenclature is kind of, kind of basic. When we, when we expanded the YAI-1, which is the Yamaha all in one uh, Okay. when we expanded that, we called it the XL, the extra large. So again, not a lot of creativity on the on the naming front, but a I, lot I, of or creative. or it is very, very creative. creative. Depends yeah. on how you want to look at yeah, it. It's descriptive and creative. I appreciate the 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 simplicity personally. Yeah, but the again, not not a lot of uh, uh, flair in the names, but a lot of flair under the hood. That YVC one thousand, for example, um, it's really it really works well if you're moving the mics around the room. Suppose you have a horseshoe arrangement. One day you'll lay the mics out. Well, by the time I'm going to get my coffee, I hit the tuning fork button. And it analyzes the room, plays noise through the speakers or the external speakers, and tweaks itself. I actually have a graph where I show this is the, 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 anal, the analyzation of the room. This is the graph. This is the filter it applied. And this is the new curve based on the filter. And all of this is happening under the hood. So back to that point, the A and AV. What, what we can do in audio now to really uh, perfect that far end sound is amazing and really enhances the meeting. You can have the best 4K display in the world. But if you've got bad audio or unsynced audio, it sticks it sticks out big time like a sore thumb. There's a really great white paper we have that goes through all of the testing and analysis that Tim's talking about. So it has all the graphs and the charts, and it's pretty impressive when you actually read through it. So I don't understand cool. any of it. But <laughs> I don't. it does. Not not to get not to get too sidetracked. I know that these guys know. Oh, quiz time! Quiz time! The logo, the Yamaha logo. Do you know what that is? Uh, all right, let me take I mean, I'm a pointing stab this, I'll, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen later, but... Let me take my best salesperson stab at it. If you don't already know, it you'll get it It looks like wrong. the North Star, always <laughs> true. He, he actually told you the answer <laughs> did he really? just a second ago. Mm-hmm. Did he? Did you? Did he I? he yeah. used... You absolutely did. About the YVC-1000. You said you just pressed the, pressed the tuning fork. Yeah. So, so that's a tuning fork. It's three tuning forks... Laid over each other. So I'm going to quiz you now. Uh, oh, no. we'll oh, oh that's right. 
So, so everybody knows out there, the Yamaha logo is three, three tuning, tuning forks, forks inside of a circle. And it's the same yo- really logo creative. they've used for motorsports, for audio, and everything, Actually, as far as I know, no, right? Sure. Here's where no? Wrong. Oh. Here's where wrong. I'll shoot you a link. But when I was standing okay. outside the Motor Museum, or excuse me, the uh, uh, Technology Road Museum, they had the history of the logo. And there's been about, I'm going to say, about 20 iterations of the Yamaha logo. The tuning forks was not original. That's right. What is interesting to me, though, yes, it is a tuning fork. Yamaha started as a music company. Um, there's actually two major differences between the Yamaha logo for sound and the uh, Yamaha logo for motors. The tuning forks on the sound don't touch the external circle. The tuning forks on the motorcycle overlap the external circle. So when I was getting my Yamaha motorcycle tattoo, I had to be really careful <laughs> that I got the right one. Uh, also, if you did notice, you give the whole like, did you give him like a twenty-minute spill to the yeah, artist? Was, like, uh, hey man, like, this we got to get this right. <laughs> I'd have been the guy with the wrong. I'd have been the guy with the wrong tattoo. <laughs> That's right. I'm you just cannot mess this up. All right, so so Greg, and there's okay. Another, there's what's another, our logo? Another differentiation though. What what's, what's our logo? So. That's Taurus the bull. Oh yeah, yeah. But what is what is this specifically? You you, you got the premise correct. Oh man. Oh, I see a nose ring in the there. Nose it's ring. the nose with the <laughs> nose ring. You got it. All right. So that's uh, another embarrassing fact. I thought for at least a year when I first started here, which was a long time ago, that that was like an alien. I had no <laughs> idea that that was. Now you're you are a Taurus symbol. You're you're born in I, May, I, right? I'm well. Okay, so I'm like one day off. I'm an adopted Taurus, but technically I'm a Gemini. Okay, so you see, I never think Taurus. I'm I'm on like a Virgo or something. So well, but so, the Taurus symbol doesn't have a ring. I'm trying to in make an nose, excuse though. for not knowing what the logo is. To me, it always looked like big giant floppy ears like oh gosh i'm and sure our ownership's gonna love that you have the bull you know, here yeah. <laughs> we are in texas that would have been a longhorn for sure yeah. absolutely absolutely yeah. so oh, the, sorry, the, other, the other real quick difference in it is that in the oh yeah you forgot to finish on the m the, the, m. the m in use in the music goes all the way down to the bottom in the motorsports the m the middle part of the m truncates midway Oh wow! So, yeah. these, okay, these I've got some a big deal. I've got some. No, <laughs> it sounds like it. I've got some googling to do because now I'm gonna. I, I I I felt like I was blowing people's mind knowing that it was tuning forks and. Okay. You know what else is? We have to make it. sure that when we when we post the cast that we're we using use the, the right correct logo. logo. <laughs> right. Don't oh, put man. the motor one up there. I'm and glad it came up. And what's funny is I, I I ride motorcycles on track days with my son, and I got a lot of friends uh, in the industry that ride and. Um, when I first started showing up at the track with my Yamaha music jacket on and all my hat and all my stuff, nobody got it. And then one or two people would come up and go, that's not motors, that's music. And I'm like, man, that's pretty good. Now uh, it is really widely known in the motorcycling community. If you have, I mean, they look at me now like I'm a poser if I show up with my Yamaha music shirt on <laughs> at a motorcycle event. They're like, well, that's not motorcycle related. <laughs> so yeah, it's a big distinction between the two and it's a very little <laughs> distinction in the logo. <laughs> Um, What's the, uh, sorry, Robert, the speakerphone you sold to the lady on the airplane? What's the part number for that? What, what, oh, that's that's the, the YVC200, the YVC which, 200. which is kind of like our entry-level product. But again, the, the technology that's in there is extremely sophisticated. And we'll, so, we'll share that. Yeah. We'll yeah. share that on screen. Yeah. It's a great, great little product. And it's, it's a good When segment. I saw it, it's like about like, oh, you can't it's, see it's, my it's hand. About, it's about six inches, you know. Um, salad plate it's size a nice size comes in black and white so you know if you're a macintosh user a lot of women like the white ones you know so it's a great personal speakerphone a, a quick quick little story on, on this on the quality of it i was giving a training to one of the yamaha music engineers over in europe from my home office and so i picked up the yvc 200 and i'm talking about i'm putting it up in front of the camera and so on i put it back down again he said hold on do that again so I do it again, you know, and I said, what is it? He said, that's incredible. The audio on my end never changed one single bit from when you had it down in front of you, lifting it up, putting it up against the displays and back and forth. And it kind of blew him away that his audio was consistent on his end. Nice. Yeah. What's the physical audio connections on that box? Uh, it is USB, Bluetooth, and NFC connections. Again, like Tim said, uh, you know, Yamaha skips SIP, so all of our products... Uh, have NSC connectivity as well. I'll tell you what blew me away about that product when I first got it. I'm like, okay, this is a personal device. This looks like 
product A and product B from my competitors. I plugged it into my computer. It sounded fantastic. I paired it to my phone. When the phone rang, it rolled over to the phone, played the conversation. When, when we hung up, it rolled automatically back to my <coughs> PC audio. Then I unplugged it, and the LED stayed on. That's when I found out it had a 10-hour battery in it. That was a real game changer for me. But the real game changer was also that it has a headset port and a speaker mute. So many of these little devices will have a mic mute because they're a conferencing device. Yeah. But if you're playing music or whatever out of your laptop, I can just reach over and hit the speaker mute without fumbling on my keyboard. That made a big difference for me. I said, okay, this is really better than the competitors. And the real icing on the cake was not just the processing under the hood, but it had an earbud port on it as well. Yeah. So I was actually in Houston at a Starbucks in a loud <coughs> environment. And I had to jump on a Zoom call, a conference call. I put my earbuds in. I could hear the far end perfectly. And with the noise cancellation and the advanced processing on the microphone, even from a loud Starbucks, the far end could not tell I was in a noisy environment. So for 189 bucks, that product's amazing to me. And the big one for me, the zipper is still on the neoprene bag <laughs> two years later. It's nothing like getting a Road That's Warrior quality. product and the bag comes apart on you, right? So That's a good segue because um, one of the challenges that myself and the rest of the sales team has is a lot of customers are going to smaller breakout areas, huddle rooms. A lot of people are even calling them phone rooms. Um, bistro rooms. Bistro rooms. There's just a ton of the, the nomenclature out there and a lot of open floor plan concepts where they want to have these little breakout rooms because someone somewhere has taken the analytics of how many smaller meeting spaces they may need right. as opposed to 10, 12, 50 people meeting spaces. And so we're, we're going out and championing products like that because you're talking about having a solution in a space where normally you would be taking your cell phone and you're probably sitting there with two or three other people and that experience is not engaging right. you know the people on the other side or even the best iphone speaker phone when you're when you're six feet away from it i mean that's just is what it is people ask you right away are you on a you know yeah so i think it's important for our listeners and viewers to understand that if at a very minimal expense you can increase productivity and engagement and audio conversations with a product like the 200 and pop those in to those little spaces where you are going to go buy a $750 Cisco video phone that hangs on the wall, you know? And, and I think that's a, a big understatement for a lot of customers. And I don't think that a lot of people know that those products are out there. I think that they just see what's on their desk and they think that that's something that they can put into. The only thing I would caution about that is that the YVC 200 is such a desirable personal product yeah. that if it were left in a small conference room, it's going to grow some legs. Like, exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but it's affordable enough. Uh, yeah. We're going to get them to buy a thousand or so. Oh, it I like your heads out there. Then it's a great product. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it does, does have a Kensington <laughs> lock on it, but it's more of a yeah. brand ambassador product as yeah. well. Yeah. I think we have a YVC customer that's going to do, they're, they're going to, so to your point, instead of leaving them in the rooms, they're going to be checked out yeah. at a front desk, which is a, a great idea. So they're going to have a dozen of them. And if someone's going to go use those rooms, all they got to do is come by and put their initial on it. It's a really cool concept. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we see that. I think the two, what we see is the 200s are issued to every person because it's more of a personal on the yeah. go mobile device. But then the 330 fits that bill, Rob. Yeah, you're yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And then gives you the, uh, the 330 would give you the option that if they, couldn't get a room but needed to meet in the company cafeteria or whatever, yeah. and you're going to have this ambient noise, you can press two buttons, put the sound cap on, the LEDs turn blue so you know you're in sound cap, and now you're kind of in nice. that, that bubble, and they're not going to hear The sound cap the is noise. fascinating to me. It really is. Um, I think that people really have to experience that to get the understanding. The verbiage is, is awesome, and it gives you this, this uh, idea in your brain, but... To actually experience that is is really cool. Well, we have a you've okay, got to see yeah you got to see an action. We and have, I was going to say real real quickly, uh, Oral Roberts University has this room called the um, Learning Collaboration Lab, I believe it's called, and it's a it's a classroom set up with huddle spaces all around the perimeter of the room. So there's about six or eight bullet tables in there with displays on the wall, five or six seats around them, and they're now putting the YVC. Uh, 330 at each one of those tables so student can come in they they you know connect their laptop uh, and now they can have their own little private conference with the far end while other student groups yeah. in the room are doing and they're not bleeding over into each yeah, other. Yeah, so it's so. about a 40 by 40 or maybe a 40 by 50 space with six little work cells in there yeah. and that sound cap applies to that where you can keep the sound locally to that table 
um, and not spill over to the other areas. It's like having cool. six different huddle areas without the walls in there. So I know we just uh, we're we're coming off of the end of of Europe's largest audiovisual show, ISC, and we're we're going to be coming up before we know it into Infocom, which is in the summer months here. Yep. I can't. I feel embarrassed. Is it? Is it June? Vegas? June. Yeah, it's Vegas. Yeah, Vegas. Okay, June. I'll be there. So, so the the attendance will be up by twenty percent because it's in <laughs> Vegas. Um, and so I, I'm sure you guys will be in attendance at Infocom. Yeah. Uh, so we have two big announcements coming up this year. One's going to be at Infocom, and it's really exciting for us. It's so exciting that Greg and I are chomping at the teeth. We we can't tell anyone what's coming, but please come by and see us. And the other nice, exciting thing is this year we're next to. Uh, Yamaha Pro Sound. So last year we were about a half mile apart on the tr on the show floor. This year we're side by side. So it's one visit to come see Yamaha. You so can see the Pro. Do you know where you're at yes, yet? Well. Are you going to be main floor? Or are you going to oh, be? Oh man, we should have come prepared. Yeah, should have been prepared. That. Oh, that's that. okay. okay. What we'll do is I we'll put up the at audio the section. We'll put up the information. Oh yeah, that, about that would the, make sense. We'll put up the booth number and information at the at the end of the show, so that way our viewers and listeners can can go there and make sure that they know where to find you guys. Yeah, yeah we'll put that up. I know we're in a good location with all the usual suspects, with the well, usual and, players. You know, you and I are always up for a personalized tour if somebody needs it. Absolutely. Absolutely. We love giving personalized tours. It helps uh, our current customer base and maybe even some prospective customers get a, a grasp of not only what our partners have to offer, but what, what Taurus is great at. Um, so, so Greg, you were telling us about, I, I want to mention this because I want our viewers and listeners to know about it. You were telling us about a, a Yamaha product app, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we used to be famous for these little glossy flip books that had all of our products and we would leave them behind, you know, call yeah. all, almost like a calling card. And we used to joke around about, they made great coffee coasters because of the laminated <laughs> sheets. If you spilled your coffee, you didn't have to worry about it. Well, with all the changes in the technology, those books became outdated really quickly. So we decided to go to an electronic app, you know, and we now have this product finder app that's available not only on our website, you know, but also uh, iOS and a Google version or uh, Android versions that you can download for free. So we've got them on our phones, our iPads, Excellent. our Androids and everything. And Sounds it makes pretty it very handy. easy to search for a product based on uh, the type of room or type of product, the you know categories that you need, wireless mics, Bluetooth, things like that. Nice. Know. Well, and we'll, sh we'll share those links on screen later too so that everybody can get access to those. Yeah. Yep. And to that point, if you'd like more information on Yamaha and the music division, particularly UC, uh, we'll have that information below. Um, so please visit them. And please don't hesitate to give us a call, email, let us know what else you'd like to hear about Yamaha. Maybe even come into our showroom here in Flower Mound, Texas, and uh, get a closer look at some of the products and see how Taurus Technologies can help you integrate those products effectively. Um, Greg, Tim, we really appreciate y'all's time. It's been very entertaining, very fun. This was a lot of fun. Um, we hope yeah, to have you guys on again. You know, if you're on three times, we'll get you your own bobblehead. Ooh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I like how both of you simultaneously go. <laughs> do, you, do you know what kind of cred I would get with my son if I came home with my own bobblehead? Oh, well, so yeah, now, now we may have to just make it two visits. Uh, We're working out. <laughs> no, thanks for well, having maybe us. After, so, maybe yeah. after Infocom, because then we've got some exciting stuff that we can yeah, talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not, that's not that far away. Yeah. Um, so thanks again to everybody. Thank if you. you'd like any more information, you'd like to hear more subjects like this or anything else, please email us at info at touristtechinc.com. I hope you guys have a great day, and thanks for listening and watching. Thank you for Bye. being such a great partner, guys. Thanks, guys.